Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. hi. <laughs> you guys hear me okay? I hate being the first speaker, and in some ways it's good, right? Get it over with. Um, lots of you there. Okay, uh, I've got 45 minutes. I'm gonna try and kick things off. I'm gonna try and like, um, I guess get the conversation going. It's a real privilege to be here. It's an amazing privilege to start this conference with you. Um, as Solomon mentioned, I'm just almost two years back in Dublin, having spent most of all my career in the States. Um, and I'm actually testing a whole new set of slides on you guys. I've you know, been trying to evolve my design story a little bit. Um, what I'm going to do is, sadly, I'm not going to answer any questions for you. I'm just going to ask a lot of questions. And then hopefully, during the course of the next two days, there's going to be some good conversations. And maybe some of those questions will get answered. Um, okay, so humans and tools and the things that we build and the reason we build things um, and the design is at the center of that. You know, I think I love this idea that we're so curious and the way we express our curiosity is through the things that we build. Um, you know, traditionally, we think about our material culture. I studied, you know, fashion, textile design here in Dublin, and just the principles of craft and making craft, and this idea that we are the people that create the artifacts that embody, you know, the ideas of a different, of a culture, a civilization, or of a time. I guess the big question right now is, we don't have a material culture as much anymore. We're building things that are not material, and I think we'll talk about that today, I mean, what does it mean to be a designer when you've trained in the principles of material culture and, you know, the artifact, and now we're making things that are invisible. Um, design, this is a great picture. Um, it's, I often ask what it is, there's too many people here to ask. So it's the cooling suit inside, worn inside a space suit, and I had the privilege of working with some of the developers of the space suit years and years and years ago, and I think this, this object, this picture embodies the intersection of technology and craft, but it also speaks to design. You know, we're so, so aspirational. I mean, you don't design for things to stay the same or to go backwards. You design to go forwards, and so it's inherently optimistic, and it's about the future. And so whatever happens with the design, we're generally a community that think about the future and speculate on the future and build to speculate. Um, I studied, again, as I mentioned, fashion and textiles, and what you do when you study that is you study the history of kind of costume and clothing and artifact. Um, I, just, I could just look at pictures like this all day. I mean, they're really beautiful. There's this really funny thing about armor um, and its function and form and its beauty and the nature of how it's built you know, for kind of practical reasons and how it can become you know, something really admired aesthetically. But just thinking about the history of the way we build and the nature of how we kind of think about the body and the things that we build for it um, and how we try and augment it. I put this slide in because this actually happened I was, when I was at Mayo Clinic, which is where I was before I came back to Dublin and to work for Fjord and worked in healthcare for a long time. And I kept kind of reminding myself of the legacy of how many creative people have kind of gone before me. And so being in a service design group at Mayo, but thinking about all the people that have been in this intersection between medicine and art, medicine and design, um, and the tradition and the kind, of the kind of precedent that was set already in terms of collaboration, like the creatives collaborating with science, um, which I think is something that we're gonna, I want to talk about today is the kind of intersection of science, technology, and the creatives and the importance of collaborating. This is great. This is a scientific glass blowing department at Mayo that no one knows was there. I didn't know it was there. So it's pretty interesting um, finding these people who have kind of their career is building these really esoteric lab equipment so that they can run interesting experiments and just the kind of, again, the intersection between medicine and creative. Um, so design is also, I started my career, um, this was a really tough job. I designed knickers for pennies. Um, and I, seriously, my first job out of college. And it was really interesting because I worked for a big factory up in Dundalk and you had to make, you had to design niggers to cost a certain amount. They had to cost like 10 pence or something at the time before euros. Um, 
and they had to be, they were, it was this big old Victorian manufacturing building full of these women who would, were seamstresses. And I had to figure out how to design something that could be made really inexpensively, that could be sewn really fast because they were paid by the piece. And so in terms of understanding kind of the, the kind of practicality of design, coming out of design school and thinking about all the, the kind of limitations and constraints that you really have to work with, this was like the best job for me to have, quite humbling. But understanding the constraints and the kind of parameters that design needs to work inside. Um, so really quickly, uh, I, I'm going to talk about some of the kind of complexity of where design's going right now and I, where I see some emerging skills, kind of non-traditional or maybe new skills coming out in design um, and how that fits back in the service design narrative, I guess. But I wanted to just like talk about this degrees of complexity. As I mentioned, you know, I used to think it was hard to design knickers and then um, I went, ended up working you know, in the kind of tech industry in Silicon Valley and at one point worked for Motorola and worked on you know, cell phones and mobile technology, worked for the Department of Defense on robotics and smart materials and future warrior, worked at Mayo Clinic and I'm now working in kind of emerging tech. And so this is a kind of story, but it's one person's career and I think it shows the degree to which design's really moving. I mean, it's kind of a moving target. And so in my career, I've had to relearn so many different skills. And I've had to kind of embrace being the novice over and over and over again, and you know, admitting the things I don't know. Uh, you know, if you think about the last, I mean, I've been working in design for 25 years, but if you think about even the last 15 years, for so long, we were in this kind of manufacturing economy and design was really kind of an artifact or, an, or a part of the industrial revolution. And then we kind of rapidly kind of catapulted into, you know, more, we went from really concrete design to more abstracted and this idea of services, service economy, like what's a service economy? And then experience economy and are we in a, a more of a data economy now? And then thinking about really feeling like we're heading into more of a reputation and trust economy in terms of brands will distinguish themselves based on this. Uh, an easier way of kind of describing the shift probably is we used to design, you know, things people wanted. We, we were told in school, figure out, you know, an a, unmet need or a latent need, something that people need, and then design it for them. And then design was much more about persuasion, you know, the design that makes people want things. And so there was this huge, and I remember I can, that shift, has happened for all of us away from designing the functional and the practical into designing the desirable. Okay, my first really controversial slide, no one's allowed to photograph this. <laughs> um, I'm, I ha I've been reflecting on, I think, what's happening, has happened in design, the industry, recently. Um, and I was doing that to get ready for talking to you guys. Um, and I think there's been a real, you know, the golden age of design in terms of it's been, you know, from a, from a, you know, economic perspective, it's been really a good period of design. If you look on the right of this, I mean, all the different design consultancies that were acquired into large consulting firms, Fjord being one of them. And just this idea of acquisition and design becoming mainstream and design being kind of commoditized and design becoming part of the kind of, cons kind of consulting landscape, the business landscape. But I feel like a picture of you know, Johnny Ives sitting on a chair talking about design is a bit like me standing up here talking about design, but I think we've become a little bit complacent. Um, and I think the best way to, to see that complacency is to think about, to compare ourselves to the tech industry. Like I was thinking recently, if I think about, if I was um, a technologist or a young person kind of thinking about going to study engineering or something like, you know, some, any kind of the sciences. And I went to the different universities and I looked at the, the syllabus they had and the program and I discovered that they were teaching this, in principle, the same stuff that they've been teaching for about 50 years. I don't think I would go to that school. And I think an awful lot of what's happened is, in design is that we haven't figured how to educate effectively for what's happening in the industry, but also what's happening in the industries around it that shape design. So like thinking back to Design is part of a bit of, you know, it maps to economies. And when we're in a manufacturing economy, we all train to design artifacts. And then service and experience economies, we all train to design services and experiences. And then technology and science is moving forward and we're not training effectively enough um, to kind of keep track. And I think it's a big problem. We'll talk about that a bit later. 
Um, you know, design when it gets, when you get really big, you know, when you become, you know, standardize your process, um, when you start to kind of become, um, you know, your approach to design is kind of something that is predictable, it kind of breaks. It just, it stops being really good. You know, these are three designs. One is to find yourself a lawyer, one is to find yourself a girlfriend, and one is to cook a dinner. So they all look the same. And so many people, so much of design for the last 10 years has been designing within this landscape of this one device and the kind of homogeneity and the, and the, the lack of imagination that this single landscape is, you know, what it's done to design, I think is something we have to consider. Let's talk about service design. So there's always the services. I think this in principle, you know, services are kind of what you can see of a system. So if you think about government services, there's this massive system behind it that often doesn't make sense, and so we determine what part of that system should be visible to the user, to the citizen. You know, what part of that do they need to understand? I mean, I worked in healthcare for a long time. The healthcare is a massive system, and the services, the design of those services are essentially the parts of that system that we want or allow the customer to see because we want them to interact with it. So there's this kind of principle of you know, what's above the surface and below the surface. And I think an awful lot of service design, we've been kept, you know, and I think this happens in terms of where we're, where we're hired and where we focus our work, is that kind of creation of that interface for the systems. And more and more, we, need to, we really have to think about becoming more systems designers. Um, this is a slide. I think it is a pure piece of work, so I know this is cruel, but um, this was my reaction when I saw this. I thought, I don't know if that's good design because it's really big. And I don't know if, that, if it is, you know. So it's a, I know it's a journey map and it's really big, but I don't know if that means it's good design. And I, this idea that some of these, there's this term that I coined, which is really dangerous, I guess, design pornography. And it feels a little bit like design pornography, is that looks amazing. It took an awful long time to make. You know, people worked incredibly hard on it, but you know, how, what did it actually teach us? You know, what part of the design process? And it becomes these artifacts, these trophies, and we, we've, you know, so much of what design has done, it's a spectator sport. You know, we're observed doing it, and we create these artifacts. Uh, Martha Cotton, who is amazing, she works, she runs our research out of Chicago. She said, beware the true, but useless. So you can make lots of maps, and they're beautiful, and they're, they're real, but they may not really be telling you as much as you think they're telling you about design and about your user, and they can be quite distracting. Um, the innovation dilemma, it's easier to describe a problem than to fix it. It's like 100 times easier to describe a problem than to fix it. And an awful lot of design, we've kind of end up just, you know, these maps are about describing the problem. And then when you turn around to try and fix them, the degree to which these maps actually show you any unique insight into how you're going to fix the problem. Um, I borrowed this slide. I just I pulled it off the internet. I'm not supposed to do that. But we, we've been doing a lot of, sort of system mapping, but I can't show that work here. But I think in principle, these giga map ideas where you're not just looking at services, and, but you're looking at the kind of system behind it and the flow of data and the nature of the kind of architecture. And it's really compatible with a lot of the, it's the kind of systems design which is compatible with software systems engineering. And it's a way that we've been collaborating really effectively with our colleagues in the doc who are the software um, engineers because we actually discovered that they make really beautiful maps as well. And so it's amazing to make maps together. Um, I'm going to quickly jump through this, but I think, again, just maybe looping back a little bit. And forgive me, because I think my slides are probably, I'm still trying to figure out the flow. This assembly model of design. So again, I used to teach the history of design at RISD, and everyone would sleep through the class. So you can sleep through the next five slides if you want to. You won't be offended. <laughs> um, I'm so used to it. But it's, I, I love the history of design. I think it's just, you know, it's really interesting, the kind of the watching what, understanding what's shaped us as a community. Um, and I think, you know, this idea of assembly, I mean, design, I mean, if you look at methodologies, I mean, we have a methodology at the dock, and it's very assembly. It's like, you do this, and then you do this, and, and then you do this. And it's linear, right? And it's kind of, you move from left to right, 
and you essentially build something. And it's based on the principles of how things are assembled. Um, and it's a manufacturing model that came out of the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, and our approach to so many things creatively are this assembly model. And it's not really working anymore. You know, if you think about the icon of good design, lots of people love chairs, right? There's a chair fetish. And everyone thinks the perfect designed object is the chair, or many people, not everybody. Um, but there's something interesting. And again, this is back to the material culture. There's something interesting if you think about the design of a chair. And again, I, I studied in like the 1850s. It feels so long ago in terms of when I studied design. And I think we were in that period of the artifact and the material culture. Um, and so what you designed for was this idea, it, was, it had to be universally accessible. Whatever you were designing, everyone had to be able to use it. It had to be really stable and predictable. So whatever you made, it had to like have a form and it had to keep that form. So if I bought a chair and put it in my living room and woke up the next morning and came down and it was a coffee table, I'd be really pissed. I'd be like, oh man, I bought a chair and it's a coffee table. So I need, it, it needs to be a thing and stay that thing forever. Um, it's a servant product. There's no really, it, it does something for you. It's a servant. Um, and it's a commodity exchange, something that you buy. Right now, all of those principles, um, essentially they're kind of, they're obsolete, they're kind of timing out because of what's happening with design in terms of the kind of fluidity of the things that we're designing, how dynamic they are. <clears throat> we don't want things that are universal anymore. We want things that are really, really unique, <clears throat> like hyper-personalized. I don't want something to be boring. The same thing, <clears throat> every time I pick up my device or use my product, I want it to surprise me. I want it to have novelty. I want it to have reinvented itself. Um, I don't want it to be a servant. I want it to be intelligent. I don't want to have to tell her what to do. I want it to know what to do. And I don't want it to be a commodity that I bought. I want it to be an experience that is supported. And so just in principle, you know, if you think about these shifts from a design perspective, I mean, they're radical. Um, I think also from design, I mean, a big part of what, we, you know, when we look at design and how people are moving away from doing things, this is one of my favorite kind of design principles right now. We often look at what people are doing. I think it's more important to people what people are stopping doing. So the designer of the future, or the designer maybe of the future, um, is less the person sitting on the sofa talking about design, and it's someone who's a lot more pioneering and who's, um, again, deeply curious. They have to be tech fluent. They have to, be, they have to love tech. They have to be fearless, and they really have to not be tied to tradition. You've got to let go of all the orthodoxies. We've been trying really hard at Fjord in, this, in the studio here in Dublin to kind of really examine and kind of consider the rituals that we have and the orthodoxies that design has and the things that we say about design and, and kind of thinking about why we believe that ourselves and really examining ourselves. These are a group of designers at Fjord. They dressed up. I think it was April Fool. I dressed up as Accenture colleagues, and we got into trouble. <laughs> they don't work there anymore. <laughs> um, Connor on the right, who's just fantastic. He's, he's a genius. He's our data design, design and AI director. People kept saying, you look like a geography teacher. <laughs> just, um, so someone said this to me uh, when I, you know, about the designers at, at the dock. I said, are you, you know, what are you, are you guys agitators? Is that why you're here? And I was like, oh, it's such a cliche. I hate that word. But it's interesting, you know, really trying to think about the role of design, you know, in a kind of emerging tech research lab inside, a, you know, a consultancy. Um, I think this is maybe the reason we're, that we're there. The idea that design is really critical to unlock um, the transformative potential of technology. What I mean by that is that technology is amazing and it can do remarkable things, but it's kind of stuck inside itself. It can also do terrible things. Um, and it's really trying to kind of figure out how to get it and, and kind of bias emerging tech towards good and to think about the compatibility of the human and the technology. And I think that's a big part of what we're doing right now. Um, this is a slide that's a bit old. It's like from 2017, but I mean, I think we're not the only people doing this. I mean, I'm looking at the numbers. This is fascinating that, you know, 
the ratio, if you look at IBM, for every one designer back in 2012, there were 72 developers, 72 software guys. And now, for every one designer, there's eight developers. So the ratio, the proportions are significant. I, and I think this slide, if you were to update it to now, it would be almost, you know, um, maybe we'd be like one to four. And so coming out of, you know, if you think about what I said about needing to be designed, you know, tech fluent, and also what's happening with education, this is where all the jobs are. But it's not just about where the jobs are. It's where the influence, the greatest influence that design is going to have is in these tech companies. And so this importance of being tech fluent um, and really comfortable and actually really curious, like not just kind of in a, in a, in a you know, really authentic way that you're really curious about tech. This is a slide that's really hard to see. This was made, it was a beautiful slide made for a, an event at Fjord. And we were trying to kind of tease out, you know, why we're a little bit different here at the dock. And I don't know if you can read it, but oh, of course you can't read it. Um, but if you look at what we're doing, it says like natural language processing, automotive vehicles. I can't read it either. Maybe you guys can read it. Robotics. I can share these slides. But just, you know, trying to celebrate all the things that we're getting to work on. I mean, trying to really be kind of proud of the fact that we're becoming really kind of expert in these areas and celebrate that. And then think about the intersection of traditional. People came in as traditional designers. We have visual design, service design, business design, you know, interaction design, content design. So let's talk a bit about the design, kind of the, how it's shaping up. So for so long, I need to look at what time is it? I don't know. There's no timer. Oh, 23. There is a timer. It's huge. Um, <laughs> it's just not right in front of me. Um, <laughs> now I can't unsee it. <laughs> it's like so big. Oh, um, so this is really interesting. You know, if you think about the tradition of design was a lot about teaching humans how to use technology. You know, this whole idea of the point, the click, the drag. You know, it's us learning how to use technology. Um, so much of successful design was the interpretation, was making technology understood. And the value of it was how well you were able to do that. I mean, every product, every digital product that was created in the last 20 years, good design was making that usable, understandable, you know, um, as universal as possible, as effective as possible. Um, but moving forward, considering how much intelligence our tools have right now, we're not going to have to learn their language anymore. They're going to learn our language. And this is a real, you know, this is a huge kind of inflection point for design. We're not going to design ways for us to understand tech. We're going to design ways for tech to understand us. So if you work in UI, you might want to work in AI because you know, user interface, the kind of traditions of user interface, intelligence inside tools, less and less that you're gonna to have to explicitly tell it what to do. It'll just be using a lot of data and a lot of algorithms and a lot of patterns in terms of understanding what to do and being predictive. Um, but there's a lot of anxiety around this, and this is the kind of question people ask is that, you know, the potential, back to this idea of like unlocking potential in technology, design's role in unlocking it in a kind of safe, and kind of considered way. People think that you know, our technology is moving so fast that the idea that we can invent things, but can we civilize them? And I think this word civilized, I love this quote because I have no idea what civilized means. And I'm, I wanna, I'd love to have a conversation about who gets to decide what's civilized. Because I think humans can be really uncivilized. So, and I don't know what a civilized technology looks like. And, um, it's so subjective, but it's a really interesting thing that we could talk about. Everyone loves this movie, right? Um, Connor gave me this slide. Uh, if, I hope people know this movie or else I'm just leaving. <laughs> but um, I think it's interesting, we talk about robots a lot, right? People talk about robots taking our jobs, taking everyone's jobs. Um, and it's kind of science fiction. But they're kind of everywhere, and I guess, you know, from a, you know, working inside the dock, you know, robots, they're not ones that necessarily physically move, but the principles of intelligent machines, like artificial intelligence, which is essentially what a robot is. We use them every day, right? We, we use them on your phone, people work with them, they fly planes, they operate on us, 
um, they help you make decisions. I mean, these are all it's, it, these are all what's called synthetic intelligence, and we're already using them. So the idea that they're coming and we're afraid, I mean, they're already here. From a kind of you know AI perspective, you know what we what we work with is the principles of technologies that can see, so tools that can see, things that can read. You know, so again, art, you know, synthetic systems that can read, they can hear, they can predict, they can touch, they have feedback, and they can connect, they can make, they can think, they can make connections. I used this image in my thesis in 1994. And I remembered it recently, and I went looking for the image um, and the kind of the little phrase I used, and I was thinking, wow, <laughs> this is so cool. And this is a Victorian, it's like a, uh, I guess it's an organ that the mouth moves. Um, and people's fascination with building um, robots and kind of this idea of kind of artificial life. So let's talk about a bit of design. Machines are users too. This is Paige McGuire, who's our content design director. She's out of our, the Austin studio. And she made this point. She said, you're actually designing from machine to machine interactions now. And so the idea of human-centered design is interesting because we're not exclusively designing for humans anymore. It's actually often there's no human in the loop. We're thinking about machines to machines. And so it's actually a huge blank canvas. I mean, if you want to think about the emerging areas of design, it's the machine-to-machine -machine conversations. People don't know how to design yet. So it's a blank slate. It's really fascinating from a design perspective in terms of being able to shape that place. Um, let me see what I've written here. Yeah, back to this idea that, you know, if this is also about this whole idea of kind of the way we speak to our tools. Conversational interfaces, this is a term that Paige uses, and also um, Grace, who is our content design here in Dublin, is this idea, it's basically speech, right? It's conversational interfaces, it's you talking to a bot. And you know, using language, using conversation as a way of connecting with data. And so data is pretty abstract, and these systems, are, these intelligent systems can be very obscure, and so what bridges the human and this really abstract system? And this idea of conversation. So there's a you know, emerging area of design around content and conversational design. Let me go forward. Design for disappearing interfaces. I like this term. This is this, this idea that, you know, again, we've all worked on interface design, like UI and UX and interaction. I, I did an interaction design program years ago. This idea of interacting with things and, you know, interfaces um, that are so screen-based and they're so vision dominant and they're not gonna be anymore. And so this idea of the disappearing interface. Um, and the degree of which we have control over our tools versus them just we're, we're acting on our behalf. Um, this is the idea of this um, century system, which is the kind of AI system and the human working in this collaborative space. This is actually a really important part, again, of designing for the kind of language between the human and the machine. And it's often called cobots. And so you think about robots. Well, a cobot is a collaborative bot. And the example here is, um, they've used is diagnostics where you have a radiologist who can look at films, uh, MRI scans um, of tissue and look for, for a tumor. And they have, I hope see what's the percentage. Again, I can't see my slides. I think it is a 90-something percent. Um, and the AI system has actually a, a less accurate, but in combination, the human and the machine are actually almost 100%. And so this idea of how these systems amplify human capacity, and so these, they're called sensory systems. They're essentially humans amplified through the use of intelligence, artificial intelligence. Um, design for immersive, augmented, and then blended reality. So again, back to kind of systems that can see. Um, an awful lot of kind of, a lot recently, a lot of kind of the camera technology. So it's not just the camera, it's the algorithms that, that basically do, do really rapid pattern recognition. So the degree to which they, it's not a good camera, just identifying, it's how they t label objects and how they identify them. And so it's the software is really driving this tech. 
Um, but this idea that you have the real world and then overlay of a virtual and these colliding. And so we think an awful lot about the physical digital worlds traditionally have been two parallel universes and they're basically collapsing into each other. And so thinking about the design at that intersection between what's physical and digital at the same time and that creating that kind of third space and designing for that third space. Design for omission. Um, this is an interesting, I heard this recently and I'm trying to figure out what it really means and apparently it doesn't exist, but I'm throwing it out there. So um, it, someone said, I think Paige said it and she, it was something about Hemingway had written something about writing and it was called the iceberg principle and it's like what you don't say but infer and that that idea in design is when systems, particularly you know, artificial intelligence, when systems are very complex and you can't show everything, because it's just impossible. You have to decide what you do show. And I think a little bit it's back to the iceberg with the systems and services, right? Like what's above the surface? And but this becomes a really important kind of philosophical, ideological question about what are you showing of an intelligent system to the user and what and who decides? Like again, it's this idea of civilized. Are you showing a civilized version of something that's not civilized? So I think it's a really interesting conversation designers need to have with their tech, their partners, their tech partners, in what's important that you show when you, when you can't show everything. Um, there's an awful lot of bias. You guys probably know this or have heard this, the degree to which AI systems, um, you basically teach it by giving it historic data. And if you have a bias, oh my god, I've just seen my friend sitting right there. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, if you have a system that you've trained with really old data and there's any bias in that data, you're going to basically amplify and you're going to get like this awful type of hybrid bias that you don't even know is there. And so the degree to which we're training a lot of AI systems, we're training a lot of algorithms using historic data and discovering they're actually reinforcing and amplifying bias. And so back to this idea of like things like facial recognition is really interesting, um, but it does a lot, it essentially does rapid profiling and it's based on, and so if you, this image on the right is, has pulled out and given a high risk score and a low risk score based on algorithmic data looking at the facial profile and determining that because of someone's ethnicity, they're automatically a higher profile. And so this is the system thinking, not because it's racist, but because you gave it racist data. And it learned from that. And the, so there's huge risk in this. And so this idea of explainable AI is an enormous part of what we're trying to do is like, how do you tell people how a decision was made? Not just what decision was made, but why it was made. And then the degree to which you can check for bias. And our, the, the, the um, group that we work with at the DOC, there's an amazing, AI team, and they're really focused on this idea of fairness assessment and exposing bias. It's, it's a huge risk if we don't do that. Um, so I'm going to kind of like wrap up with some kind of maybe more kind of ideas around where we see people going in terms of a little bit more kind of you know, behavioral that I think relate a lot to design as well. Um, I would say in general, organizations, they put an awful lot of energy into exploring the future of technology and they put very little energy into exploring the future of humans. And so this is a big, this is a big um, opportunity for design, is that so many organizations, let me see if my next, yeah, they, they're tech optimistic. There's this tech optimism that everything's gonna get fixed by tech. It's kind of intoxicating and people are, put, it's where all the investment money is going, it's where a lot of the energy is going People are putting their bets on tech. And what they're not considering is that likelihood that the future may be is as likely shaped by people as it's shaped by technology. And so if you think about the blind spot that a lot of organizations have and the role of design in that blind spot in terms of thinking about the future as shaped by people. Uh, so this, we have this expression, we've been looking at this a lot actually at the doc in terms of this whole idea of post-human and the cyber psychology of like per persistent use of digital tools and how it actually shapes, you know, um, not just behavior but psychology and even your chemistry. So it can get biological, the degree to which your, your biology is being shaped by, the t by persistent use. 
Um, we're using this expression, the way we change is changing. So from a design perspective, we used to have all these kind of standard ideas, thanks, Tim, standard ideas about people. We thought, well, you know, people at a kind of very fundamental level are very similar, and they care about, it's like a Maslow thing, they care about similar things. And there was this kind of enduring set of principles about how people behave, how they might react to things, how they feel about things, you know, how to motivate them, what they're afraid of. But we're changing, and so the way we change is different. We're changing a lot more through the tools that we're building. We're outsourcing a lot of things that we used to do ourselves. We're letting tools do it for us. We're taking our hands off things. Um, so our relationship with our technology is really maturing. It's really changing. And that's, again, from a design perspective, we need to think about letting go of any of these traditional ideas about people and the things you build for them and really start to think about this very intimate relationship people are having with technology right now and how you design for that. Um, this idea of impatience is something also that's been really fueled. You know, this kind of, I guess maybe it's a social media thing and this whole need it now culture and this kind of spontaneity, but um, we were talking recently from a kind of looking at a kind of customer lens and this idea of how consumption is changing and the impact that will have, you know, if, if you think even environmentally, just behaviorally. And it's based on, you know, this kind of same day delivery and everyone competing to get things into people's hands. Things like not needing to take your wallet out of your purse to pay for something, so you have no moment to consider your actions. You're, so, you're acting in this spontaneous, almost manic way. And technology is making this, they call it frictionless, which is a, a word that sounds really benign and kind of like something you'd like. You'd sign up for frictionless, right? It just means you have no time to think. Um, so these discrete, I think I mentioned this before, discrete touch points this idea that we will have moments where we interact with our tools and we discreetly um, tell them what to do and know what they're doing is going to go away based on just having really intelligent systems that are more kind of ambient. Um, and so the thing we need to design for is not designing for clever interfaces, but designing for trust. And what does it mean to design something that you can trust? And how do you build trust with something that you've built? How does a person build trust? Um, and then there's the age of distrust. I mean, no one knows what to believe anymore, right? And it's a kind of fake news. And I mean, maybe it's a good thing because maybe there isn't any one truth anyway. Um, but I think there's a decline of the expert and the traditional notions of truth from a design perspective. You know, people don't really know what to believe anymore. And so it makes designing in terms of, you know, establishing an idea harder and harder. People are more suspicious. Um, so the, the idea of the future of persuasion, like, you know, if you think of from a marketing perspective or even a brand perspective, people aren't as gullible and people don't believe things in the same way. And so, you know, what is the future of persuasion going to be? Uh, social cooling is really interesting. This is a term where they're looking at people kind of having quite a strong kind of reaction away from particularly social media. Um, and kind of becoming more and more aware of the kind of the, the, how they're being manipulated by the tools. I mean, most social media tools were developed based on principles that came out of the gambling industry. So this addictive principles of reward. And so if you think about the tools that are being put in the hands of kids, you know, when you want them, when you want to have your coffee and not be disturbed, you give your child a tool that was based on built to be addictive. Um, we, it was interesting recently, someone at the doc mentioned that they were looking at um, people talking about, uh, I guess, distrust or mistrust with their tools. And that actually the emotion is moving away from doubt and mistrust to guilt because we're becoming more and more aware of the level of addiction we have. And we're more and more aware of what the tools are doing, but we're still using them. And so our emotional relationship with tools has moved from being one of distrust and kind of suspicion to guilt, because we actually know the degree to which they're manipulating us. I think this is the last slide. I think that, so the battleground for design, if that's a term that sounds kind of pretentious, um, but I think big design topics, trust, privacy, truth, security, and identity. I think there are areas, new areas for design to think about, you know, what does it mean to design for these things? Thanks. <laughs>